I love listening to you talk this week about how to basically sell people something they hate because everybody thinks cybersecurity is dull or not for them. But also it's not tangible. You don't get a man in armor standing over your computer. I think it might be easier to sell if there was a like a sexy man mm-hmm. in armor or, you know, like a maybe a Marvel action character. That might make it even easier to sell if your prospect is into that kind of thing. Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. Another bite. Hello, I'm Sophie Law and welcome to Another Bite. This is the YouTube show for MSPs who want to improve their marketing and grow their business. Every week we delve in depth through another episode of Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. We of course have to have Paul Green on. I tried to get that out, there was no question about it, Uh, but also sometimes special guests, including this week. But we will start with Monsieur Green himself because you said in the podcast this week to start at the end or start with the end or something about the end. Yes, it was to start with the end in mind. So this is a famous saying from a guy called Brian Tracy. And Brian Tracy is one of the most famous self-help gurus of all time. And somewhere in his wide body of works, he wrote, start with the end in mind. So what he means is you kind of visualize and figure out what the end result needs to look like before you plan how to get there. So for example, let's say you were writing a book. I mean, let's take, let's take this book here, which is a very, very fine book. And we may be talking to the author of this book <laughs> in a second, uh, but I'm sure that the author of this book had, they, they knew what they wanted in that book before they sat down to write, to write a word of it. So they knew how they wanted to influence the reader. They knew what the message was they wanted to get across. And, and that was what they started with. And then they, they probably worked backwards and worked out what chapters they needed to go in there before they ever wrote a word. What if you're listening to that and thinking, I would love that. I'd love to have like a day or a week to go off and plan the end. But I'm too busy fighting fires daily fires you know i either don't have enough staff or i've just got too much on my plate to plan the end yeah that's a really good question and luckily we have a superpower to help us and this superpower is called sleep you see when we talk about planning (laughs) the end in mind you don't actually need to be conscious to plan the end in mind now what i'm going to say here might sound crazy but it every single human on the planet has this ability when, when you want to f- solve a problem the, and, and you just can't get your head around that problem, particularly if it's late in the day, the best thing you can do is actually go to sleep and l- leave that problem in your head when you go to sleep. And I'm sure you've had this, Sophie, where you wake up in the morning and you get in the shower and you suddenly think, oh, I know how to solve that problem or I know what that mm. thing is I want to do. And it's like it's, like it's just since people often say, oh, my best ideas come to me in the shower in the morning. No, they don't. What's happened is when we sleep, our brain goes into a different kind of mode. It goes into its big problem-solving mode because suddenly there are great portions of our brain that are no longer needed for just being, well, we, we don't need to solve problems uh, when we're asleep uh, in terms of you know the, the problems that we have day to day, just walking around or driving or whatsoever. So suddenly a huge proportion of our brain is dedicated to problem solving. And anytime I find I've got any kind of problem or a plan or something I want to achieve, the first thing I'll do is I'll actually give myself two or three days to think about it and then not think about it. So I'll keep it top of mind. I might have it as a post-it note up in front of my desk or something on the refrigerator or something like that. But I keep it front of mind, but I try not to actively think about it. And what happens is I wake up with really good ideas. So my my brain is doing all the hard hard thinking, so I don't have to do that hard thinking. Mm. In relationships, that would be called avoidance, and I would not recommend it. Um, The other thing I wanted to ask you about was the idea of letting go. So you were talking about, even if you don't plan to sell your, your business for years and years, to think about... Um, how to operate the business without you or can the business operate without you. Um, But isn't it really hard to let go when it's your baby? It's not just you thinking about your next job in another company. This is something you built. So any tips for letting go? Yes. So I I did this in a previous business. Uh, I had a marketing agency, which I sold in 2016, and I'm actively doing it in this business I have now. So this business is currently six years old. Uh, We have a great team and I'm probably... 20% 20% away from not being necessary. So the, the business will still 
you know, be my baby. It will still be something that um, I will want to uh, be involved with. And obviously, I, I, I do the, the, the fun stuff like this and working directly with our clients. But the critical thing is when I've finished that process of essentially working myself out of the business, letting go of it, I then have a choice. And my choice will be what work do I want to do in the business? that I enjoy. So I love filming stuff like this. I love doing the podcast. I love talking to people like our guest, Jennifer. I love talking to our clients. What I don't like doing is invoices. I don't like admin. I don't like emails. I don't really enjoy running projects, all the boring kind of stuff. So letting go is actually not really about letting go of your baby. It's actually, I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's It's about spending quality time with your baby. So anyone with children will know that when your kids are like three or four, it's not really always quality time because three and four year old kids are just annoying. And yes, you have moments mm. where, oh, aren't they cute? Aren't they lovely? And then you have other moments where, can you, dad, I can't sleep, you know, and, and you're, you're trying to chug a beer and watch a horror movie on Netflix and they want you to go up and read them another story. <laughs> when they get to like 11, 12, 13, it's, it's the opposite in that they don't need you for all of those things. But then you have, you might go for a, like a 30 minute drive with them and you have the best conversation ever, just you and them. And it's really quality time. And that's, that's how I think you, you have to transition with your business. You have to push your, te- your business into those teenage years where you're choosing to do just the fun stuff with your business. That's how you stay in love with the business. Because you can tell the business owners w- who are needed in the business because they, they get tired. They burn out. You know, If you want to be a business owner for 30 years, you have to let your, your business go in the same way you have to let your child go and, and the child chooses to come back to you mm. or the, biz- the business chooses to have you have you do it. So it's, it's, it's really, really hard to do, but it's a very necessary, uh, you know, very necessary uh, tr- transformation to go through. All right, one more for you then before we go over to Jennifer. And that is, um, you said a great bit on the podcast this week about um, never knowing whether you were going to reach people at the right time. So it might just be that perfect serendipitous, but it was almost like you were selling a cheesy rom-com, but I really enjoyed it. It's the sort of one you think, I'm not going to enjoy this. And then you put it on and afterwards you're like, yeah, JLo, you got me again. Um, but what about reaching people at the wrong time? Like, is there value, even if it's not the right time right now, in reaching them? So when they're six months or 12 months down the line and they're like, hmm, actually, I'm starting to look around, you, you're there in their brain. Yeah. So what you're talking about here is relationship building. And I mean, in terms of reaching the wrong people, you you send a, a message out to 100 people. And certainly for what MSPs sell, 99 of them aren't going to act on that, aren't ready. And in fact, they're, they're, they're literally shut down to it. Um, in the podcast interview, Jennifer mentioned the reticular activating system, which I asked her to explain what that was. And she she, she explained <laughs> it very well, that it's it's where your your brain when when you're thinking when you're thinking of buying a new car you see that car everywhere and and before mm. when you weren't thinking of buying that particular kind of car you don't see it everywhere but it is still there it's just your brain is filtering it out so when you when you send marketing to people who are years away from switching to a different MSP. It just doesn't go in. They don't see it. It's just not important to them. So actually, that that thing of, of hitting them at the right time, it, it's... it's the, the, Yes, the, there is that right. At the point at which they're start, it's starting to come into their brain that thought of, ah, oh, do you know what? These aren't the right IT people for us. We we really could do better. At that point, even if that's six months before their contract is up, their reticular activating system is suddenly the gates are open, and they're they the it's it's a, an opportunity for the messages to go in, and that's why a lot of the marketing that I recommend is long term relationship building. It's things like writing a book, writing guides, you know, writing a buyer's guide. It's putting people on your email list. It's sending out a physical printed newsletter to them. It's sending them other stuff in the mail. It's doing social media content every single day. Because what you're looking to do is every single day you're looking to get in front of people who who it's nearly the right time. But for those whose reticular activating gates are open, you want to make sure that you you don't miss a trick to be in front of them. Because when they actually come to the point of being ready, willing, and able to make a decision, that window of time is tiny. It, it can be as little as a week, two weeks, three weeks, mm. a month. You know, that point where they're actively going out and talking to people and they're, they're solidifying in their brain, do we go with these people, these people, or these people? And that window is so small, we cannot wait until that window. Ideally, we want to build a relationship with them in the months and months and months before they get to that window. 
So you mentioned there neatly, it's like writing a book. I wonder if you have a book nearby that you could just, well, I don't know, wave around you, in front of the camera. You know, I haven't got one yeah. book. I've got two books. Ooh. I've got two versions of the same book, what which is which is pretty cool. Are the chances of that? Do we possibly, by any chance, have the author of that book with us this well, week? Well, if I if I click my fingers, there's the author of the book, Jennifer Bloom. Uh, <laughs> hello, hello. Good to Hi, be here. Jennifer. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Vanishing from the ether, uh, like a little fairy godmother. Um, Absolutely. Sherpa is my favorite word to describe you. You are a Sherpa, you're our guide um, for cybersecurity. And I love listening to you talk this week about um, how to basically sell people something they hate because everybody thinks cybersecurity is, is, you know, dull or not for them. And what I wanted to ask you is, is there a bit of a double-edged sword? Because not only is it something that you know you hate or that bores you but also it's not tangible you don't get a man in armor standing over your computer sadly um you know every day and it does that make it more challenging how do you make it how do you bring it to life I think it might be easier to sell if there was a like a sexy man mm-hmm. in armor or you know like a maybe a Marvel action character that might make it even easier to sell if your prospect is into that kind of thing. Uh, but but your your point is valid. You know, having to sell something that is intangible, you're selling risk mitigation for a threat that most of these organizations have never experienced firsthand, and so. So that does make it difficult because it it isn't something that the average prospect can wrap their head around. And so there is naturally some skepticism. Are are you just trying to sell me something I don't really need? Um, Or are you really doing what's in my best interest? And so, uh, you know, we we talk a lot in the marketing world about no like and trust and adding people to our list and cultivating that relationship through through content and newsletters and, and staying in front of mind, all of that goes to benefit the sales process because people do know you. They feel like, okay, I, I've seen you talking about this. I've read the real stories that you've shared. So maybe I really do need this. Now I'll at least hear you out. It, it, lowers, it lowers the resistance just a bit. And you were a guest this week on Paul's MSP Marketing Podcast. But in case people haven't listened to that, uh, the book is out there now and, you know, you're, you're getting feedback and hopefully and people are reading it. Is there one tip or one fact in there that you're really enjoying sort of blow people's minds or like enlighten people that they just hadn't really considered before? So the, the one that is that I'm hearing the most is, and I don't have the page number, but there's a beautiful Venn diagram inside of the book uh, where really cybersecurity sales can be distilled down to two, two arguments if you want to look at it as, as if you're, you're in court. Um, and the first argument that you have to prove is that a cybersecurity incident will be highly impactful for the business owner. If they do nothing um, and they and something does happen, it will deeply impact their business. And so you have to prove that. You have to get the prospect to agree with you that, okay, if something happens to me, it, it will deeply impact my business, very impactful. And then the second piece that you have to prove, that second argument is that if you don't, if you don't prove that it is likely to happen, uh, then they won't invest because why? Why would they invest in, in fairy tales? I, I'm paying my, you know, I'm investing my money. I'm paying my money to you to stop a threat that I don't think is ever going to help, uh, to, ever going to come to me. And so, you have to prove both of those because if you don't prove it's going to impact your business significantly, then you will hear objections or stalls or excuses in your sales calls like, well, I would just bounce back or I, I, it would be okay. I have $25,000 in my bank account. I'm sure that's enough of a buffer or they, they just haven't understood. You have not proven the case that it could impact them. And then if you don't prove to them that it's very likely, then you'll hear things like, well, I don't know anybody that this has ever happened to. I'm a small business owner. How could it happen to me? I don't think the criminals are really after me because you haven't proven the case that it's highly likely to happen. But when you prove both of those, that's when the the two circles come together in this beautiful center where they now realize what everybody listening to this podcast, we all realize this intuitively, is that 
it is highly likely to happen. And if it does happen, it can be devastating and even end the business. And so um, those are the two arguments. And that's what I'm hearing is that that framework has been super helpful for people to, to wrap their head around and even go back and, and replay some sales calls that they lost and say, ah, now I know why I wasn't able to convert that particular prospect to my plan. That's why they call her the Sherpa because she leads you back into the light. So I'm glad you didn't give the page number because we just want people to, <laughs> to read the book instead and find it. Got to make them work hard, Jennifer. Give us the title and tell us where we can find out a little bit more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the book is available on Amazon. It's Simplified Cybersecurity Sales for MSPs. And if you want to learn more about me and how I work with MSPs, you can go out to my website, mspsalesrevolution.com. And if you're really eager to learn more about my methodology, go to mspsalesrevolution.com slash smart, because I have a smart system that I walk all of my clients through to help them install a proven sales and marketing system into their business. Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on another bite this week. That's about all we've got time for. But don't forget to listen to Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. Contractually, I have to say that. I'm off to Google where I can find a man dressed as a security guard to stand over my computer for no reason. Just I like the idea now and I can't get it out of my head. But please do join us again. Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. Another bite.